So Leslie, tell us, you, you know, you had worked with um, Francis Coppola on uh, Apocalypse Now. Yeah, I mean, it was for, since 1971 or 74 when the conversation came out. It was my dream to work with Francis. I saw the conversation and I was like, this is what I want to be involved in. And it took until... 1977 and several tries that I was hired to work on Apocalypse Now. I was hired to work on it for six weeks and I ended up being on it for a year and a half because Francis, uh, he likes to edit and re-edit and rework. You know, post-production uh, is really an important part of his uh, process, unlike some directors. But uh, well, we were at the tail end of Apocalypse Now and you know, Francis is manic depressive. I mean, I think it's well known that and then you didn't know when, when he was gonna be in the nice peaceful mood or in the manic like crazy man mood. And he came in one day and he's like, I bought a studio and we're like, you know, and I've hired all these people and you know, he just it seemed like a madman. We didn't know what was going on. But yeah, as it turned out, he bought um uh general service studio in Hollywood. It was kind of a B grade movie studio, and uh, there he was going to make this movie, which he did one from the heart, all shot at that studio. And before, before, before this, he was mostly based in San Francisco. It was you know, Zoetrope was up north, so this was a big, this big way of going. Well, I, I was mentioning this, Julia. It's ironic because, um, well, he went to Hofstra in Long Island. He grew up in Queens, and then. Uh, he then moved to L.A. to go to uh, cinema school at UCLA, and he got started with Roger Corman in Los Angeles. And then all of a sudden he just said, I'm through with L.A., I'm through with all you people. He sent back his Director's Guild card, and he moved up to San Francisco. And I guess he started sort of a studio up there, Zoetrope. Uh, um, and when I met him in uh, 1973, I think I had come up to interview for a job with him, and uh, he was sitting there in the – and I was, he, it was before he'd made The Godfather, but I was already, already terrified. No, he'd made The Godfather. Uh, but then he's like, oh, here's this uh, this guy right here sitting next to me. He's the future of cinema. And it was George Lucas. And so he had this already, this idea that he was going to put together a stable of people and he was going to, you know, have stable directors. And everybody was attracted to France's energy and you know, liveliness and ability and, um, I'm sorry. What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, go ahead. I just, I just, yeah. so, so when he, when he bought the, uh, when he bought the studio, it was, it was a way to so then, get oh, it yeah. even bigger and keep this, you know, put, brought, bring the stable to, uh, to, to Los to, Angeles uh, and make it, you know, make the movie in his own prop films on his own property in the way all Hollywood was doing. Right. I mean, he's obviously a visionary because he was visionary in moving to San Francisco in the first place. And uh, he formed a company with him and Peter Bogdanovich and uh, Billy Friedkin at the time called the Director's Company. Uh, and that, their idea was that they were going to be the answer to the studio. They were going to be like United Artists was originally, which was a bunch of uh, creative people making their own studio. But then... You know, I guess he wanted to have that physical property and he bought the place in L.A. So it's ironic. He was against the studio, moved up to San Francisco, and then he went back down there. And um, I think he really had a love for the uh, 40s movies, 40s musicals, movies that were made on sound stages, which is, again, ironic because he was part of the generation that was shooting on location and shooting with handheld cameras and portable like the rain people was all portable. And then he wanted to go back in the other direction and do all dollies and, you know, lighting on a stage and, and you know, interior for exterior and day for night and all these studio type things uh, that he have gone away from originally. But but this was a film that, you know, in one way, look at the past, you know, and he hired, I think he hired Gene Kelly as a, con, you know, he had Tom Waits and Gene Kelly as music consultant, and Tom Waits did, you know, music. Michael Powell was another person that he brought, as Fred was reminding me before, you know, he brought on, you know, in, in this new Zoetro. So he was looking at the past and the tradition of Oliver that he loved, but this film is, it was a, a, a breakthrough, technologically speaking, when it was full of experimentation. Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, yeah, just watching it, I'm remembering um, 
you know, he recreated Las Vegas uh, uh, on a table, basically. The lights were all miniatures and, um, you know, using motion control photography and um, visual effects, you know, there there are visual effects credited. It was, you know, Star Wars had happened a couple of years ago, but it was still very early for somebody trying to uh, do that. He uh, he did this thing called, they credited electronic cinema, where he would take the story uh, boards and film the storyboards. You know, storyboards are what you draw before you make the movie to show you what it's all going to be like. And you film the storyboards and then have actors read the dialogue and cut together the storyboards to make it like the movie was going to be so he could visualize it. That was kind of a revolutionary, uh, I mean, I shouldn't say revolution, but it was an advanced technique. He was always experimenting with techniques. I mean, he still is. And um, trying to figure out ways to achieve his vision, I think, more efficiently, maybe. You know, filmmaking is burdensome. You've got a lot of people. You got a lot of equipment. Uh, you've got to break it down into very small pieces. And so the you know more like we were all so happy when film cameras went away, and then all of a sudden there were these lightweight digital cameras that you could shoot forever. And you know, he was an early advocate of that kind of of those kind of techniques. And again, the irony. It's just like with fashion, you know, where the hemlines go up and down. Now everybody's going back to film. They've been going back to film for a while and rejecting all of these digital advancements that we were so excited to have. And and, and the sound and the music and the film are also used used in a very an extremely unconventional way. Can you talk a little bit about what the work was that like? I mean, I unfortunately I wasn't as involved in the music as I would have liked to have been. Um, Tom I, Tom Waits started here as being one of the collaborators. A lot of these people show up, you know, over and over again. Tom Waits was in uh, Rumblefish, and he was in Dracula, and um, Alan. Garfield credited as Gorwitz here. You know, he was in the conversation, Fred Forbes in the conversation. But um, I think, uh, you know, the idea of putting Tom Waits together with Crystal Gale was, was I always thought was like phenomenal to have the, the scratch, scratchy, gravelly voice with the beautiful, uh, pure, pristine voice. And this was Francis' attempt to make it a musical. I'm not sure, I'm not sure it really succeeds in that level because. I don't know. Well, that's up to you all to decide. But but it is, but it is, um, and I haven't seen this in a really long time, but it is, um, it, it's it's very, um, uh, as I said, unconventional, the idea that you have these two, these two voices, you know, telling, essentially taking the story, like in a traditional musical, but you don't see them. And so that, you know, the people that uh, are actually acting the, the, you know, the story don't, don't sing and, and only, you know, only the table down. So it's all, it's all very experimental. And Except for Nastasia Kinski. I, I wanted to die when that came up. Uh, we, we had, <laughs> but she sings little boy blue. I, you know, I, I did the loop and the ADR, which is where you bring the actors back to redo their parts. And, um, she, we already knew that she couldn't really sing. And so then when they said, okay, we're going to be doing little boy blue, I said, well, are we going to have like a vocal coach or somebody to help her sing? And they go, yeah, 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 sure. And then she shows up and there's no vocal coach and she'd done no training whatsoever. And it was absolutely no different than what was originally recorded on set, which to, you know, I mean, it's not really singing. So then, uh, and we recorded about maybe, I kid you not, like 400 takes uh, in one day of her doing it over and over and over again. Uh, and, you know, I was like really going out of my mind. And then, you know, we put it together, put something together. It's kind of so-so. And then she calls me from Germany like a month later saying, I know I could do it better. I know I could do it better. Let's do it again. So we go back in the studio, another 500 takes. It was like just, you know, we were dying. And then and that's what we ended up with. But <laughs> I mean, we could have just gone with first take. But anyway, she, I mean, I feel like you kind of go with it. She's not a professional singer, but Terry Gar is really a dancer. So when she starts dancing, I mean, wow, you know, she's, and, and Raul Julia, he, he can sing too. Well, they are, but, they're, they're beautiful dancer. But I think part of the idea was to have these people that look like regular people. They were in Fred Astaire, you know, you know, just, just happened to be a great dancer. But I think they, the notion was to have these people that had no uh, particular 
uh, you know, visible, apparent technique or skill to, to, to you know, to, uh, to be these characters, both of the, the dream characters and the, and the characters that are reality, uh, reality based. So, um, uh, another thing I didn't tell you before is, you know, Coppola, this film was budgeted for 16 and ended up costing 23. It was something, something like that, you know, and he had, done pre-sales it was all producing he couldn't find a studio that was you know that was actually financing the whole thing was too experimental and i do think and uh tell me if, if you disagree i do think that the industry resented him he, you know he had almost bankrupt united artists uh with apocalypse now you know he left disappeared went to the philippines came back with this thing that everybody thought it was a disaster brought it to the Cannes film festival you know, uh, won the Palm d'Or. So, you know, the industry is even angrier, is getting all this recognition after having wasted all this money with all the folly. And so I don't think, that, you know, they, they were after him a little bit. And and and, 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 and this project was strange. Uh, it wasn't The Godfather, you know, which is his sort of the movies that everybody loved and, and they're traditional and they're great and they're epic. It was, it was, a, it was a strange, you know, it was a strange film uh, and, and it is a strange film. So he ended up having to find money, which he didn't have. And a lot of people were not paid and on the set because of, because he, he didn't have, you know, he didn't have it. And yet they managed, you know, with the collective support of the, of the crew and everybody that was working, he managed, he managed to finish the film, but the film was a financial disaster of, colossal proportion yeah i mean we didn't you know often didn't know if we were going to get paid or not and uh you know I, I we all wanted to support his vision but there was so much chaos because it wasn't just that the studio was struggling because of this film it was because you know he was producing four other films at the same time and you know he was spread way too thin and there was drug use going on I'm, i mean i'm not sure about him but certainly a lot of other people and he hired you know he's very loyal so so a lot of the people are like his friends from school and you know like his mom and dad are in the film i even forgot about that the elevator they the are elevator. They're, they're, they're the older couple in the elevator and it was so perfect because that's just what his dad was like you know just really like pissed off all the time but so <laughs> so it was like you know his mom was really nice but so it it was just um chaos and and yeah he had a, a reputation for being very irresponsible and you know he he was uh, he is a genius he was look at his filmography he's a genius but he he bit off more than he could chew with this one and you know he knew it um chris you'll appreciate this we were the film was already in the movie theaters and he's like we got to make a change and we're like you can't change the picture it's in the movie theaters he's like oh yes i can so they called all the prints back did you know that? They called the prince back and they swapped a take. I think it was when they'd go out onto the street um, on the 4th of July, big celebration, and swapped the take. Like This kind of behavior didn't endear him to the financers. Uh, and so so then, then the next, and then he, yeah, he borrowed $25 million from Chase Bank, which he defaulted on that loan. And, you know, they had his studio, his, his winery as collateral, uh, but I was actually, you know, he, his life was an open book. We were on the ADR set, looping stage, and he was talking to the bank. He's like, well, if you take my house away from me, I'm not going to be able to make any movies and pay you back. So, you know, good luck with that. So they couldn't collect on the, on his collateral. But on his fall on the next film, the, um, the Cotton Club, right? That was the next one. Right, because uh, Rumblefish and um, no, he did he did Rumblefish and out, he did Outsiders and yeah. Rumblefish and then Cotton Club. Okay, so on Rumblefish and Outsiders, he had to prove he knew he had to prove that he could be responsible. Those films were made on a budget, but on Cotton Club, he actually had mob money. You know, that's what all he could get. And I met the the mob guy came to one of the parties. He was pretty scary, but uh, <laughs> he was a real mob guy. Yeah, and 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 it, and it's and it's interesting because I I think you know most of us love both the, uh, the you know the films that he did that's totally independent and in defiance and the one that he did for the studios and you know in in compliance uh, you know but uh, but especially at the beginning of his career he was never fond of talking about the Godfathers or anything that was successful and he, he liked this ones because he controlled them you know and in fact right now you know he has been has been finishing his his new film which is a film that he totally self financed. 
um, because nobody would nobody would buy it. You know, it's you know, it's over a hundred million dollars, and his megalopolis has been writing and tinkering with it for a long time with some of his oldest collaborators, Dean Tavularis. You know, the the set designer. Uh, yeah, you know, he's is you know he's working on it. And uh, and some of his old actors, you know, his old actors that they, they, you know, Dustin Hoffman is, you know, went back working. So I, I think it's it's really interesting the way he project, you know, he sees himself. But for a moment, and he really thought he could uh, win Hollywood at their same game. You know, he could beat them. You know, by having the studio, by controlling creat- creatively everything, bringing people that all people he liked, controlling kind of distribution, you know, with pre-sales in Europe. And he was inviting all these European filmmakers. He was inviting the vendors. He had hand- Godard. Godard. And he tried to make films with Godard. You know, they started a film with Godard. So it was an incredible moment for, you know, for him. And then it all kind of fell apart because of the finance of it is. And I think it was just too bigger a dream, too big a dream uh, to, to, for him to hold it together on his own. Yeah, Vim Vim Vendors, Vendors, Hamlet, yeah. that was made around the same time. And, um, you know, he produced a lot. Of, you know, he loved having the, the the camaraderie. He would, you know, that was coming from when he was at Hofstra and in the theater department. And he would talk about how great it was with everybody around. And, you know, when we were working on Dracula, he said, you know, when we were, I was in the theater, the actors would help break down the sets and carry, you know, things for you. And, you know, like that, that was what he wanted and people loved being around him. And he, you know, he's just uh, a gambler. He's a big gambler. I mean, huge gambler. He's taken gambles that I don't know. I certainly would never even think of in a million years. And with some gambles, they pay off. But with uh, this particular one with the studio, it, it, it didn't. And he's been, you know, he's been buying all his film, most of his films, the one he can, you know, not not the Godfathers, obviously, but the, you know, the Independent has been taking them. It's now he's controlling them, and he's reworking them a little bit, and uh, um, and putting them out. But this has been, I mean, I think that they, uh, he had a restoration of this at the few years ago, you know, ten years ago, and but this is another rework. And, and clearly, you know, he's still playing with it. And, you know, and some of it is new releases and, you know, putting the thing in the market and having some 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 returns. But some of it is actually an obsession, you know. And Cotton Club, he made it longer. And he added this two beautiful dance scenes that were not in it. Mm. And so it's very, it's very fascinating uh, the way he's, you know, and he hasn't worked much recently. So. I, I do want to say one thing about this, um, which is um, his cl- normal collaborator, editor, is uh, Walter Murch. And um, Walter is, like, you know, very well known in his own right, uh, uh, having been involved in very important film editing. Uh, this one, Walter, they had a falling out. There was falling out on uh, The Black Stallion. Uh, Walter wanted a writing credit, and Francis gave it to... You know, uh, Earl Ballard. No, Melissa Mathis, oh, yeah. who was his. He was having an affair at the time, and Walter just. Uh, then they went to the directors, the writers' guild, and then Walter just said, "I'm through." So, you know, I mean, Anne Garceau, who cut the film, she's lovely and she's really good. But Walter was the person who could really say no to Francis. Who could really, you know, Walter was just tenacious and. I feel that the film lacks a little bit for not having his his presence. Um, do you have any questions? There. Hold on, hold on. Let just. Are you involved in the restoration from like Dolby mixing, or is it just? I'm, I haven't much? been involved in the restoration. Sadly, you know, I would have loved to have been involved in any of this, but. Uh, someday I will run into Francis again. I mean, we were very close for like 15 years, but then we all went off in our own directions. Sophia there. Uh, is the gentleman there. The, visually, I just thought the film was just amazing. It was just really, really beautiful. Now, I was just wondering, um, the the scene that was two thirds through, it looked like it was actually filmed in Las Vegas. Was it, or was that all a, a set? Uh, 
You know, I mean, I, I'm in post-production, so I wasn't, wasn't around for the shooting, but I had that same, at the airport, you mean? I had the same impression. Some of the scenes, I'm like, wow, this is impressive they did this on a soundstage because, yeah. uh, you know, I, I saw the, all the stuff with the signs in the desert. That was done at the end after all the shooting, and so I saw that happening. So I know, you know, that was not not done um, in Las Vegas, but... I believe it was all done uh, on yeah, the stage. Yeah, the scene in the in the two thirds through of that, but you know, there's like 100 extras. They're all dancing and singing and oh all yeah, that. yeah, that That's was so on studio. Yeah. yeah, that was yeah. what uh, sound stage. Yeah, that was, was, was that was stage? that was that was yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Fun fact: uh, Gus Van Sant, who's the director, I work with a lot. He's an extra in that scene. <laughs> <laughs> okay. He was fast. Everybody's obsessed with Francis. He was obsessed with Francis from way back. There. The way you're describing him reminds me of the movie about the Godfather, the o the offer. The way you're. I loved the offer. I loved I did it too. But I did not I love it. this movie. I'm sorry. It's all right. <laughs> it's all right. I went to see it on the opening week, and there were like ten people in the movie theater, and I was just like, "Oh my god!" And Chris, saw, you said you saw it. Amazing. This one? Yeah, there was a huge, huge. There you go. There was a huge screening of it at Radio City Music Hall. It was big, big special screening. It was very heavily, um, like there was a huge uh, array of, of celebrities and stuff, and, and the, the reaction wasn't strong. It yeah. was really, uh, actually pretty depressing. Someone else saw it there at the same screening, right, Fred? Uh, Fred. Uh, oh, cool. <laughs> I remember I was a little depressed, but actually tonight, I was, uh, yeah, I wasn't, in, I was somehow a little depressed with it. Perhaps he did fix something because tonight I really liked it. But uh, it was very beautiful. That's also probably why I liked it. I think there's a lot of heart in it. You know, excuse the pun or whatever. But um, he's really, you know, that's one of his strengths is the emotion and getting the performances from the actors. But you know, Fred Forrest is not, a, he's not a leading man. He, he may rest in peace. He died, you know, a couple of months ago. But he, you know, Francis eventually got fed up with actors because uh, he got the reputation of being an actor's director. And so actors would show up and expect him to make magic and turn them into Academy Award winning actors. And so on this movie, he sat in a trailer the whole time. He didn't interact directly with the actors he would yell over a megaphone and i remember hearing on one of the outtakes he's like pretend like you're in love with her like he was screaming that on a megaphone so he would he were you know fred forrest was in the conversation he was in apocalypse now so he was somebody who you know was familiar and comfortable and uh you know would go along with things and you know i, I think he needed somebody stronger this is um, the uh, this this thing, but you know, uh, it's another thing. You know that technically, you know, it seemed frivolous at the time, and uh, um, and I was a student. All these news were arriving from, you know, I was in Europe, and all these things were arriving, you know, through the magazines, and 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 it seemed so weird that why would you want to be in a you know in a trailer. Uh, far away from the actors, and, you know, and just sort of yelling at them from inside and watching these things on video. Well, which is essentially what you know what they do now. You know, which is yeah. so. Yeah. So you know, he, he, he through his desire to be artistically creative, he kind of figure out technical things. And I think it's been you know he's done that in the past, uh, where where he would just to express himself in an unconventional way from an artistic standpoint. He he, he kind of you know trailblazed uh, some 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 technique and I think some of the photography here with you know with and some of the effects with, with you know he had work with Storaro on, on Apocalypse Now uh, and and so you know it's completely different photography but they you know they they loved the uh, the experimentation and the fact that Storaro could play with light you know he I remember at the time uh, uh, he was talking about painting with light Storaro you know so this is as as close as you can get to painting with light, I think. Yeah, Sorraro's brilliant. One Sorraro story on Apocalypse Now, uh, they were shipping stuff to the Philippines and Sorraro brought his camera crew, all Italians from Italy, Rome, I believe, and there was one shipping container that was nothing but pasta. I know. <laughs> and the production complained about that and then Sorraro's team said, no pasta, we're going home. 
<laughs> uh, Matt. Uh, yeah, it was really interesting. This is the first time I've actually seen seen this movie. Um, yeah. And yeah, I'm going to be thinking about it for a while. <laughs> um, one question I have is that it seems that the... Uh, what was the creative... Um, direction in terms of sound in terms of uh, like approximating something that would sound sound real and full like las vegas city streets and how much was it that um was that tempered to kind of feel like it was more of a stage or a set piece like a kind of artificial yeah i mean that's a good question because we you know the brief was you know make it realistic but make it like heightened reality because there's obviously so many moments where like when uh that thing with the scrim where you go through to the you know the foreground background action and all that and so we you know we added sounds where it was appropriate to make it real but it was the idea was not to make it like we were shooting on location it was made meant to be like a 40s movie where you can tell that that they're on a set yeah i mean it seems to me even in 40s movies you have more traffic sound and sort of like a more it, it, it felt sometimes on those streets in in uh in Vegas almost like he it, it's sort of like there's pride in that this is done on a set and he yeah. Does, yeah. wants totally. wants you to remember that or keep that in mind totally yeah you saw the credit it said filmed entirely at Zotrope Studios and uh, yeah i was very proud of that and i i heard a story i don't know if you know this is true did george lucas trade participation in one of the star wars sequels for points on one for the one for the heart <laughs> uh, or one for the I, heart. I don't know that i don't know that but i do know that uh francis offered to buy american graffiti from universal studios he wrote them a check and said you know because they said American Graffiti was a complete disaster. And Francis was like, fine, I'll buy it. And then they were like, well, wait, wait a minute, maybe we're going to rethink that. So, but I'm not sure if I maybe it's possible. I didn't hear that. I didn't hear that. But Francis always liked to be like he was George's big brother. So, but maybe George helped him out. You know, he was he was produ also producing. You know, Carol Ballard's very interesting filmmaker, Black Stallion, was produced at Zoetrope at this. You know, pretty much at this time, just before uh, this. So he gave also a way to you know a gener you know a generation of young filmmaker. I mean, he's always been interested and in, to be in sort of a, a godfather, you know, yeah, <laughs> for lack absolutely. of a better of, of a better word, to you know to his friends and to the people he likes and 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 with the Europeans, he also distributed. I mean, he 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 did he organized a tour of Abel Gant's Napoleon. You know, that he was working with Tom Laddy. Uh, he, you know, Tom Laddy was in charge, which was was a great curator and 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 a producer. Uh, he was in charge of special project at Zoetrope, and he he was he was advising him on. You know, he brought uh, this gigantic uh, film called Hitler by uh, Jürgen Silberberg, a German filmmaker. It was like four hours. Uh, you know, and he toured that, and and so he was interested in 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 talking about cinema internationally at, at a very high high level, and also working in the commercial you know industry with artistic value. So it was a very interesting experiment. I mean, he produced a film with Norman Mailer. You know, did sound on that. You did the sound on Tough yeah. Guys. Yeah, on Tough Guys on Dance, and uh, on Yeshka Holland. Uh, he did. Uh, she directed the Secret Garden, uh, and he produced that. He produced that, yeah. And Mishima, of course. Paul and Mishima, Paul Schrader's Mishima. So, I mean, the, these are all very interesting films, and some of them are flawed, and you know, but but they're all like you know, high, you know, incredibly interesting, interesting films. The film Con Godard never came about, but there are traces, you know, there are fragments of it. Yeah. 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 There's one back back there, and then I think we probably need to wrap. Um, you mentioned that uh, Francis's life was a little bit of an open book, and I know, especially coming out of Apocalypse Now, it was a little bit of a tumultuous time in, in his marriage, right? How much of this was in the story, and, and how much of that tinkering and post-production was him working through some of that in his personal life? Yeah. Um, we were, I remember, um, I, I think Ellie stayed away 
um, because uh, no, they have the house down there. I I don't remember seeing Ellie. I got to know her pretty well on Apocalypse Now. Um, uh, but yeah, their marriage was very tumultuous. Uh, I remember we were looping on Apocalypse Now um, with um, uh, the chief of the boat. Uh, and he was screaming and Lance, you know, off that 60, whatever. Anyway, he was doing some looping. We were having to do it over and over and over again. He was screaming at the top of his lungs. And while he was screaming in the booth, Francis was screaming at Ellie on the telephone, you know, saying, you're not going to get a dime. You know, like it was not just me there, but everybody was hearing him screaming at his wife and, and no, nobody was paying attention to, um, uh, the the actor, and then all of a sudden we come up for another take, and he opens his mouth to start screaming, and nothing came out, and we had basically destroyed his voice, you know, just because of Francis paying attention to yelling at his wife. So uh, anyway, he got his voice back, fortunately, but um, but but I think that the idea of the you know the the juxtaposition between reality and dream is very strong in in his films. You know there is always like a meta dimension to to them. Even the rain people, you know the the housewife, she leaves. You know, you know there is always this aspiration of of a, of a heightened uh, reality. You know that of, rea of 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 reality being better than what we deal with and being more like a dream or more like a movie. So I, I think it's an it's it's a theme. In, in 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 the work you know and the same for cotton club he's got you got the mobster and this beautiful uh, you know dances and entertainment it's a very it's a very strong uh part of of of, of, the, of the work i i mean they've been married for so long now and there's been a lot of ups and downs but uh somehow they figured out how to make it work last one anywhere then oh here Oh, <laughs> yeah, it's just um, I think it's a genius film. I think it's as close to opera as any film. Wow. Be. OK. Wow. Which That's is, amazing. Which is a big component. Yeah. That's, I'm yeah. Sure no, but it's a big component of, you know, of, 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 yeah. of his work and of course, his relationship with his, you know, his father and uh, Last one. Okay, very last one. Well, this might be uh, just prejudice on my part. I, I just love comedy. And I realize this film is, you know, it's a love story. And it's just, it, it's really good. It flows from beginning to end. Um, and I, I really like that. There's the scene. The only really funny scene was in the restaurant. When we were all Julia sits down and then there's that whole altercation i thought that was funny and i thought god if there just been maybe two or three more little comedy scenes like that it would have maybe lifted the film up a little bit but that's just my opinion but i just i i just really liked that little scene it was it was the only scene i laughed at you know? <laughs> I, I, I got a few laughs i was surprised uh, i didn't remember the humor but definitely it's there I mean, it wasn't really funny, ha ha, but it mm -hmm. was, you know, it. <laughs> well, what do you call them? Rudolph Asselino. I thought that was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. That was definitely an homage to, you know, Spike Jones and the 40s kind of stuff. That definitely. Okay. Well, thank you again, Leslie. Leslie is a, is a local treasure.